Welcome to MFM Micro Learning Program. Today, I would like to talk about HbA1c. HbA1c means glycated hemoglobin resulting from forming a covalent bond between glucose molecule and beta chain of hemoglobin. It is established as a time on our gold standard yak stick of long-term glycemic control. In discussion about HbA1c, we all should remember a person named Samuel Rubber, an Iranian scientist. He discovered the linkage between diabetes and hemoglobin A1c, used primarily to identify plasma glucose concentration over time. In June 2003, Rubber was awarded the Samuel Rubber Outstanding Discovery Award by the American Diabetes Association. And then let's talk about the history of hemoglobin A1c. Firstly, in 1966, Holmquist and Schroeder identified five subtypes of hemoglobin A, including hemoglobin A1c. And then in 1968, Robert recognized A1c is elevated in people with diabetes. And in 1975, Gonick and Cerami suggest that hemoglobin A1c is related to metabolic control. And then in 1993, DCCT established A1c as a valuable clinical marker in people with type 1 diabetes. And then in 1998, UKBDS established A1c as a valuable clinical marker in people with type 2 diabetes. At last, in 2010, EDA recommends to use HbA1c tests for the diagnosis of diabetes and prediabetes. And then, how do we perform HbA1c tests? Firstly, EDA recommends a method that is certified by the NDSB and is standardized to TCCT, Diabetes Control and Communication Trial. And then, uh, according to NICE guideline, it should be performed using methods that have been calibrated according to IFCC, International Federation of Clinical Chemistry. Mm -hmm. And then, diagnosis by HbA1c. If HbA1c is more than or equal to 6.5%, we can say that the patient has diabetes. Hemoglobin A1c 5.7 to 6.4 percent means prediabetes. Here is some limitations of HbA1c: conditions that affect recent turnover, such as hemolytic anemia, GCPD deficiency, recent blood transfusion, use of drugs that stimulate erythropoiesis, pregnancy, and ESRD. In such conditions, there may be discrepancy between HbA1c result and true mean glycemia. However, A1c does not provide glycemic variability and hypoglycemia. HbA1c measurement reflects average glucose concentration over the previous 120 days. So we all should know how frequent to monitor HbA1c. Alright, if Target HbA1c is merited and the patient has, has if the patient has good glycemic control, uh, two times per year is enough. Uh, on the other hand, if the patient uh, has poor glycemic control and cannot achieve uh, HbA1c target, A1c uh, should be monitored four times per year. HbA1c target depends on individual patient. Our EDA recommends our HbA1c target in non-pregnant women or should be less than 7% without significant hypoglycemia is appropriate. Our A1c target recommended by Canadian Diabetes Guideline for most adults with type 1 or type 2 diabetes, A1c target should be less than or equal to 7%. For adults with type 2 diabetes who are at low risk of hypoglycemia, A1c target should be less than or equal to 6.5% to reduce the risk of CKD and retinopathy. For those functional, for those who are functionally dependent and for 
those with recurring hypoglycemia, or those with limited life expectancy, and free elderly and or with dementia. Uh, for such kind of patient, even C target, seven point one to eight point five percent is acceptable. To achieve E1C less than or equal 7%, the patient should maintain fasting plasma glucose within 4 to 7 minimum per liter and do our post prandial glucose within a range of 5 to 10 minimum per liter. Although fasting plasma glucose and do our post prandial glucose are within the normal range, uh, E1C target less than 7% is not achieved. If so, you should consider to maintain within the narrow range of fasting plasma glucose 4 to 5.5 minimum per liter and or post prandial glucose 5 to 8 minimum per liter. On the other hand, it must be balanced against the risk of hypoglycemia. Pharmacology therapy according to hemoglobin E1C. After approximately 3 months, if the E1C target is not achieved by metformin alone, you can combine it with any one of the following drugs sulfonylurea or thiazolidine thione or DPP4 inhibitor or SGLT2 inhibitor, GLP1 receptor agonics or PCA insulin. The choice of agent. To add is based on drug specific effects and patient factors. If E1C is more than 10%, it's time to initiate insulin. If E1C level is more than or equal 1.5% above the glycemic target, to recombination therapy is required. If E1C target is not achieved by monotherapy within 3 months, you should consider direct therapy. If the target is not met even after therapy for next three months, triple therapy should be considered. This is the glycemic control algorithm of AACE 2020, American Association of Clinical Endocrinology. If A1C is less than 7.5%, monotherapy is started. If A1C is within the range of more than or equal, 7.5 to 9 percent. Direct therapy should be considered, and in next three months, if E1C is still in this range of 7.5 to 9 percent, triple therapy is suggested. If E1C is more than 9 percent, and in addition, there are symptoms of hyperglycemia, insulin therapy should be initiated. On the other hand, if E1C is more than 9 percent, but uh, the patient has no symptoms of hyperglycemia, therapy or therapy can be considered. Regardless of glycemic control, for patients with high ASVD risks and or CKD, SGLT2 inhibitor and or long acting GLP-1 receptor agonist is recommended. This is the correlation between E1C value and estimated mean glucose values. For example, uh, E1C 5.5 to 7.5 percent uh, is related to mean glucose 6.2 to 7.7 millimole per liter. Thank you so much.